The following program presents principles designed to promote good health. It should not take the place of personal professional care. Viewers should always consult their qualified health practitioner before considering alternative treatment. Um, so you may already know a little about Barbara, it may not be reciprocal, but uh, Barbara, whereabouts is home for you? Um, I live in, uh, about an hour from a little town called Kempsey, which is exactly halfway between Brisbane and Sydney on the east coast of Australia. Ah, nice. And uh, tell us about your family over there. Okay, well, um, my husband and I have a health retreat there called Misty Mountain Health Retreat, and People come from all over Australia and actually all over the world. We had two guests last program who were from California. Wow. So they've seen the YouTube uh, lectures and, and uh, come over, so that's quite exciting. We had someone from Saudi Arabia and his wife recently to get help for psoriasis. They came back one year later and his psoriasis is totally gone. And for 20 wow. years he's been battling that. He was 40 and his specialist said he would never be free of it. So that's just a little insight. You said about my family, my husband Michael and I have been married for 18 years and when we married I had six and he had two children. So we have eight children and the ages of the children now are 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 35, 38, 40. And we have 14 grandchildren. Wow, okay. <laughs> oh, that's, that's lovely to hear. And uh, a little about your background. You you're uh, have a health background yourself, Yes, right? I do. Uh, in my 20s, I trained as a psychiatric nurse at Northride Psychiatric Hospital, and then I, uh, my partner and I went to the hills, and we were hippies. Do you have hippies in New Zealand? Yeah. We went back to nature, and that's when I really got interested in health. I didn't want to give my children drugs, and that's when my journey began, I guess, is wanting to treat my children naturally. So little by little I learned. It's difficult to say where my learning began, but I think my biggest learning curve was uh, my children. Mm -hmm. And one of my children had severe asthma, so that was a big learning curve, that one. The good news is they're all still alive, <laughs> and they survived the experiments, and uh, they are treating their children the same way they were treated for any little illnesses. And I, there's a reason for that, and that is that it works. <laughs> nice one. Mm. Final question. Mm. Uh, when you're not uh, running seminars or travelling, speaking, mm. what do you like to do in your spare time, Barbara? Ah, oh, I love gardening. Ah. <laughs> and I love knitting and I love sewing and I love cooking. But I, I'm passionate about health, so I'm always reading. I've always got a few books in my bag. Okay. And some people think I've got a good memory, but I don't have a very good memory. I work on it. So when I do read and I find things that stand out, I um, underline, write them somewhere else. And uh, I feel a great responsibility to help you become informed with the most recent information that's coming out. So um, if you've heard my lectures before, you will know there's no two ever the same. <laughs> so it's very much influenced by what I'm reading and learning at the moment. Fantastic. Well. Without further ado, we'll hand it over to you and thanks so much Thank for you. being here. Thank you, William. The lecture tonight is we're going to start right at, I think, the most important spot and that is what is the true cause of disease. You see, I believe that the human body was designed to heal itself and it will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. Notice that little tiny two-letter word, if. As a gardener, I know that if I give my plants the right conditions, they will be magnificent. My rose plant will give beautiful roses if I can keep the wallabies away. <laughs> I've got one rose plant and the wallaby can't get up the top and the roses are magnificent at the top. <laughs> Same with the human body. If you give the human body the right conditions, you, you will, you should get optimum performance. Now, if you're not getting optimum performance out of your body, the other three-letter word, there's a question here, why? 
And Newton's third law of motion states that to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. There's an old Proverbs, Proverbs 26 verse 2 that states that the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, no problem happens without a cause. There is always a reason. And I believe we all should be private investigators, investigating the cause, because there is always a reason. The two main theories in medicine today, I call them the two Gs, the germ theory and the gene theory. I'm going to address those theories tonight to see if they are the true cause of disease. We're going to have a look at the germ theory and the gene theory and the true role in the human body because I believe everyone should be their own doctor because only you know what you feel like, only you know what you've been through and only you know how your body responds or reacts to different things. Isn't that true? Now the ladies I'm staying with, when we arrived this afternoon, they said, we've made you some soup. I looked at the soup and I said, ah, my body doesn't like capsicum and they went, oh no, <laughs> it's a capsicum soup. <laughs> so I had fruit soup. I can't explain why, well in some ways I can, but my body says no to capsicum and so I listen. Mm -hmm. I listen and that's a very important part of being your own doctor is listening. When your body says no, don't, don't do it. And if there is pain in your body, what we must do is find out why the pain is there. You see, you know what pain is? Pain's this. Your body's knocking. Now, if you don't heed the knock, what happens to the knock? I don't go too loud here or the board might fall over. Let me show you what drugs do to that knock. The body's knocking, that's the pain. You put a drug on, what's happening? You're still knocking, but you can't hear it. It's like I was in Fiji once at a youth camp and these girls brought this young man to me. They said, he's got a sore knee. And I said, oh, so my detective hat immediately goes on. What happened to the knee? Oh, I, I, um, I was running and tore a tendon. Oh, um, what have you been doing to the knee? But first thing, how long ago? Oh, three months ago. What have you been doing? And he got out a packet out of his back pocket and it was full of big pink tablets. And as a nurse, I know exactly what the big pink tablets are. Any guesses? Painkillers. I said, oh, where did you get those? My auntie's a doctor. She gives them to me. Oh. I said, well, I can't do much to that knee. <laughs> what was that young man doing? He wants to surf. What does he do? Throw a couple of painkillers down. He wants to, he wants to play soccer. What does he do? Throws a couple of painkillers down. And what's happening to the knock? I said, my suggestion is that you go to the hospital and get some crutches. Because you know what that knock's saying? Get off the knee. <laughs> it's not rocket science, is it? <laughs> you gotta get off that knee. How do you know what to do with that knee? If it hurts, don't do it. And you probably find on crutches it's not hurting. And put it up. <laughs> and start giving the body good nutrition. Mm -hmm. Maybe starting go to a physiotherapist. Maybe have an X-ray. Find a, Can you see my? Can you see my point? And I'm sorry that his aunt gave him that because his aunt doesn't realise that every time the knee would usually say "Don't," he can't hear it, and he's doing things he should never do. And what's happening to the tear? It's getting bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger. That's why what we've got to start doing is this. Here's a simple one. If I'm cold, I put a jacket on. If I'm getting hot, I take the jacket off. We're listening, yeah? And we certainly listen to that because it just gets far too uncomfortable if we don't listen, doesn't it? And when we get far too uncomfortable, that's when the body's basically getting a sledgehammer saying, do something. I love teaching people how to be their own doctors how to listen. 
So let's have a look, first of all, at the gene theory. 1953, headlines in the newspaper, Secret of Life had been discovered. Watson and Crick's two scientists had been able to unravel the DNA. What's the DNA? It's the genetic code inside every cell. Now, I've drawn a big circle here, and it's our cell. Now, we've got 100 trillion cells in our body. That's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? There's an amazing psalm in the Bible. It's Psalm 139. And 139, verse 14, it says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And I always think of that, the further inside the human body I go. Now, we are just a bunch of cells, so to understand how the body works, to understand how the body heals, we need to go inside the cell. I call it the CBD, the central business district of the human body, is the inside workings of the cell. And we're going to go right into the nucleus where the DNA is. The DNA is the genetic code that determines your height, I was nearly going to say your size, but only your height, actually. <laughs> what you eat can often determine your size. Determines the colour of your hair. Some people say, Barbara, you're in your early 60s and you've got no grey hair. Well, sometimes I put my glasses on in the mirror and I see a few. <laughs> Do you know, my father is 90 this year and he's hardly got any grey hair. My mother died when she was 51. She had no grey hair. It's a bit of genetics there. My husband is white. <laughs> He's a couple of years younger than me. His mother and father, before they died a few years ago, they were white. Can you see the genetics is happening there? And if people see a photo of my husband, they say, oh, he's blonde. And I just smile. <laughs> my husband tells me I'm not allowed to go grey. <laughs> but it's all in the DNA. 23 chromosomes from our mother, 23 chromosomes from our father. And because I cannot change the colour of my eyes, I cannot change my height, I cannot change uh, the, the shape of my legs, I cannot change the length of my toes, I, I cannot change that. And nothing I do will change that. Maybe if I perm it, it'll go curly, or if I straighten it, it'll go straight on the hair, but I, I cannot change that. And because I cannot change that, often dis disease is often said to be caused by genetics. But just as I cannot change my height, the colour of my eyes, and the colour of my hair, unless of course I dye it, I cannot do that, but I can change the genetic code that has come down regarding my health status. Isn't that good news? My mother died at 51, a cripple, in a wheelchair with rheumatoid arthritis. At 43, she was as me. Genetics loads the gun, ladies and gentlemen, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. And as we go through these lectures, you will see that. So I have strong genes, strong genetic weakness towards rheumatoid arthritis. And every now and then, my body goes like this. And there is a knee <laughs> that does that. And whenever my body starts to go like that, I do a little bit of adjustment in what I'm doing. I might take some turmeric capsules, which is very strong anti-inflammatory, and the knock goes away. As I stand here, and the last few months, there is absolutely no pain in that knee. <laughs> but every now and then, something might happen, and my body goes like this, and I'll make a few adjustments, and then it'll settle down. Oh, it's so nice to know how to manage what's happening in our body. But can you imagine if I said, oh, it's in my genes. My mother had it. And on Saturday morning, I'm going to go to the mind and show you what a powerful part that plays in the health status of our human body. But if I accepted that and said, well, it's just me, it's in my genes, chocolate cake, <laughs> coffee, tea, all the acid-forming foods, what would happen to my arthritis? It would get bigger and bigger and bigger. Nice to know how to manage things. The man I mentioned from Saudi Arabia who conquered his eczema, his psoriasis, he's managing it. And if he goes off the rails and does everything wrong, what'll probably happen? 
<laughs> It'll come back. Oh, oh, time to, time to readjust and get it under control again. A lot of information in the DNA. If you were to put all this information into alphabetical language, it would fill a thousand books with a thousand pages and three thousand letters on each page. That's quite phenomenal. What is the DNA made up of? It's made up of the food we eat. So the outside strands is made up of polysaccharides. And polysaccharides simply means many sugars. So everything we ate is made up of many sugars. That's the outside strands. The inside bands is made up of amino acids. And amino acids is the breakdown from the protein that we eat. So my protein today was, uh, I had some beans, some cannelloni beans, I've had walnuts, I've had some uh, almonds, brazils. There's my main amino acids today, minerals. Minerals glues it all together. So it is minerals that glues these amino acid bands to the polysaccharide outside strands. Where do we get our minerals from? The highest mineral content is found in your vegetables and of your vegetable kingdom, the highest is your greens. Dark, green, leafy vegetables, very high in minerals. Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And he didn't know what I've just shown you there. He didn't know that our DNA is made up of the very food that we're eating, the very code, the very blueprint, the very formula that determines how we're remade. And when I look in some supermarket trolleys, I think, how will their DNA ever be made? Have you noticed? In Coffs Harbour, a big town near us, there's quite a few Africans have moved there. And I was in the supermarket one day and I looked in one trolley and it had big tubs of the cheapest ice cream you can buy and huge bottles. I don't know whether you can get three kilo Coke bottles, but they look very big. Ooh wee. Do you know, they come to our country and say, wow, look at the cars, look at the technology. These people must know how to eat. Wrong. <laughs> Do you know what else we've got that's very big? Hospitals. Mm -hmm. We're constantly being remade. Did you know you've got new eye cells every one to two days? That's why if you get something in your eye, you really should get it out within that day because otherwise new eye cells will grow over it. And it also explains why if people have eye surgery, it's usually day surgery. They're usually home in a day or a couple of days. The eyes heal very quickly. The next quickest are the cells that line our gastrointestinal tract. Now the gastrointestinal tract is a very interesting part of the body because it's not part of the body. What do I mean by that? It's a hollow tube and it's about eight meters long and we know where the opening hole is, it's our mouth, and we know where the other one is. <laughs> And anything that goes into our gastrointestinal tract is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to tiny substances, then absorbed into the blood. Then it becomes part of you and me. The Bible calls the blood the life of the flesh. One writer called the blood the river of life. In fact, no blood into any area in your body, no life. So that's the gastrointestinal tract. And the cells that line it are made every three to five days. Let's have a look. The lining of our gastrointestinal tract looks like this. And way down here, one writer called that the nursery. So the new cell is made there. It travels up and then away it goes every three to five days. We've got a new skin every month, where does the old skin go? Isn't that why we wash our clothes and wash our bodies and wash our sheets and vacuum our floors? And In fact, that's part of the dust that every housewife knows accumulates. We've got a new liver every six weeks, that's under your right rib, very important part of our body. New bones about every three months, so we're constantly being remade. I think it takes about two years and we've got a totally new body. Isn't that good news? 
And if you give it the right conditions, your body can get better and stronger and fitter, no matter the age. Did everyone hear that? What I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you how the new cell is made. And we're going to look at how a new gastrointestinal tract cell is made. All the information is in the DNA. In fact, inside every cell of the body, all the information is in every DNA on how to make a whole new body. But we don't want the information in the gastrointestinal tract on how to make a new eye cell or liver cell or bone cell. And so all that information is switched off and all the information we need is switched on. And a photocopy is made of it. It's called RNA. RNA is a photocopy of all the information. You see, DNA cannot move. It's stuck in there. And so RNA is the photocopy and it comes down to another section of the cell called ribosome. And ribosome is the little factory where the new cell is made. So RNA comes in, it's got all the information, and in that little factory, the new cell starts to be made. The first brick is laid down. What's the first brick? It's an amino acid, maybe it's tyrosine. Then the next brick is laid down. What's this brick? This one is maybe phenylalanine. Then the next brick comes down, and that may be methionine. Can you see what's happening here? Every amino acid is like a building block and it fits into the next one and the minerals glue them together and every three to five days out pops a new gastrointestinal tract cell. It is the blood that brings the nutrients to the CBD to supply all the nutrients that's needed and as the old cell breaks down it is the blood that takes it away. It's an amazing process. Every home should have an anatomy and physiology textbook, amazing book, learning about how your body runs. So what about an irritable bowel syndrome cell? By the way, question, if someone has irritable bowel syndrome cell and their new cells are made every three to five days, then they should be healed in, let's be generous and say two weeks. Is that a reasonable statement? I think it's a very reasonable statement. So let's have a look at why they don't heal. Well, let's look first of all at how the new cell is made. And so the information is photocopied, RNA. RNA, the photocopy of all the information, comes down to ribosome, the new, where the new cell is being made, the little factory, the little workshop. And down is laid tyrosone, as it should be. But as the cell, the new cell is being put together, a few problems arise. There's a, a piece of information missing. Cell's not quite sure what to do now. We haven't got the information on what goes next. And there's a rogue cell wandering around. Basically, what I mean is a rogue <laughs> molecule. And it'll just force its way in here. Doesn't fit very well, but it's going to force its way in. And then the next one, maybe it's phenylalanine. We've actually found it. How does it fit into there? It, it, it tries, but can you see it doesn't fit very well? And then we're lacking magnesium, very important mineral that glues it all together. So the next cell is hardly, the next molecule, sorry, the next molecule is hardly holding on and it was missed. There was another piece missing. So the other rogue cell that is common in the breakdown of chemicals, heavy metals, electromagnetic field excess, these rogue molecules are floating around the body. And every three to five days, out pops a new irritable bowel syndrome cell. Now, in that very simple illustration, I touched on a few reasons why people aren't healing. Not just from irritable bowel syndrome, but from many diseases. You see, if the formula's not right, the new cell cannot be made right. 
If the blueprint is not right, it's not going to work. Sometimes I will dress make and I have a recipe, well, a pattern, <laughs> recipes for the food. <laughs> I have a pattern and I can make this skirt without even ever trying it on, put it on and it'll fit perfectly. Not all patterns are like that. I have a pattern at home and every time I make a skirt from it, I have to readjust and readjust. I should throw it out, it's just hard to throw something out. If the pattern's not right, it doesn't work. <laughs> if the formula's not right, it won't work. There are some doctors, nutritionists, naturopaths today who are looking at healing from the DNA up and doesn't that make a lot of sense? But what I want to do now is I want to have a look at why the, there's damage in the cell, why there is damage in the DNA. So we'll do a big question mark here. And as we go through the program this week, we will be addressing mineral deficiency, we will be addressing amino acid deficiency. But why is there damage in the DNA? Because if you don't know why, you can never turn it around. 92% of DNA damage research is showing today is caused by a mineral deficiency. A mineral deficiency? Surely we are eating better now than we ate 100 years ago. Well, in many areas, yes. But the problem is the soils are deficient. Why are the soils deficient? The soils are deficient because of the way agriculture is done today. You see, traditionally, land was always fed. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say a person had a crop of corn in. The corn would be harvested, and what the farmer often would do, he'd just pick the corn, and then he'd get his tractor, and he would plough up the corn back into the soil. And a lot of the nutrients that are in those stalks from the corn, where do they go? Back into the soil. Very important to feed the soil. I know as a gardener, traditionally, you always do a root crop, take it harvested, and then you would add compost. That's the best, all the nicely broken down. And then the next crop will be a top crop. So you alternate your top and you alternate your root crops because they take different nutrients out of the soil. And in the Bible, there, there's a formula too. They rested the land every seven years. So every seven years, the land had a rest. And when it was time to plough up the land again, it was all ploughed up and it was ploughed several times. So the weeds that were growing there, that's called a green manure crop. Those nutrients went back in. But today, many times, the same crop is grown again and again and again. The soils are getting exhausted. And often the farmer puts superphosphate in the soil because it produces show ponies of vegetables. Looks good, but it doesn't taste good. When you eat an apple off a tree, when you eat a strawberry off a strawberry plant, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Do you know what the flavor is? It's minerals. So when you buy fruits and vegetables that are tasteless, I can just about assure you they're probably mineral-less too. Now, when someone is living on fast foods, we had one lady come here. She said, we do McDonald's one night, Kentucky Fried Chicken the next night, uh, the local takeaway the next night. And very little minerals in fast food. But we have people today who are eating vegetables every day, who are eating fruit every day. But because the soils are deficient, the plants are deficient. Now, superphosphate binds up or it locks calcium. Calcium's called the trucker of all nutrients because when calcium is increased in the soil, all the other minerals piggyback on the back of it. And so the plants are deficient because a lot of the minerals are locked up in that soil. No wonder so many are mineral deficient today. And on top of that, you put something else into the body that's leaching the minerals that are there, stimulants. We've got a nation today who are just about living on the stimulants. They're always tired, so what do they take to get a pick-me-up? Caffeine. 
Now, caffeine is very effective at leaching calcium and magnesium out of the body. Now, they're two very important minerals. So let's say we've got a person who's mineral deficient to start with, and on top of that, they're drinking the coffee. No wonder so many people are mineral deficient, and that, of course, is causing damage in the DNA. Sugar. How could something so sweet be so poisonous? We have three books in our library at home, or in our health centre, I should say. One's called Sweet Poison by David Gillespie. I think many people have heard of that or maybe read it. Another one's called Pure, White and Deadly <laughs> by Dr. Yutkin from, from England. In one of his chapters, he claims it should be banned. It is so toxic. And the other book is called Sugar Blues, because you know what sugar does? It causes a high, then it causes a low. There's the blues <laughs> down there. And because of this high, low, high, low that the sugar causes, pancreases are wearing out, the arteries are breaking down, 300 diabetics, actually I think it's up to 400 now, 400 diabetics diagnosed daily in Australia. That's daily, and I'm pretty sure New Zealand won't be much different. Because I look at your shops, I look in your supermarkets, and yeah, New Zealanders are eating much what Aussies are eating. Many, many people are sick through ignorance. Many people do not realise what these foods are doing to them. Another is um, tobacco. 4,000 chemicals in one cigarette. Whew. We had a lady last program, just last week. She was coming off 30 cigarettes. No, she was coming off a packet of cigarettes a day for 30 years. And it was the first time she'd stopped. At the end of the week, she said, I can't believe I'm not suffering more. <laughs> Why aren't I suffering more? I said, well, you've done a couple of days on juices. You're having the steam sauna every afternoon, diving into the mountain stream, back into the steam bath. You're sweating out a lot of the poisons. And when you sweat out those poisons, they're not in your body to, for your body to have to withdraw from as much. She was excited. She said, I just watched my mother die from lung cancer and I made her a promise on her deathbed that I would stop smoking. I said to her, how do you think you'll go? She said, well, I'm going to give it my best shot. I said, great. <laughs> That's good. It's nasty stuff. Many, many die from not only the lung diseases, but many associated diseases that can be linked with tobacco. Alcohol. Alcohol is a neurotoxin. It's a brain poison. There is no safe dose of this. Now that statement I just said, there is no safe dose of alcohol, the health department in Australia have issued that warning. No safe dose of it. It's a neurotoxin. It should never enter the human body. But what we're looking at now is, the, is causing DNA damage. Children are being born today with holes in, their alve, in the honeycomb shape around the lungs from smoking parents. Children can develop emphysema when they're getting into even their 30s never having smoked just because of the weakened lungs from their parents. We're getting children born today with fetal alcohol syndrome. This just isn't parents drinking, or the mother, drinking alcohol in pregnancy, though that is dangerous. This is the DNA that both parents have given their children. What's also causing damage in the DNA is chemicals. <clears throat> It is estimated that we are introduced to 30,000 every year. You have no say over your neighbour's house, but you have total say over your little castle. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, have a good look in your laundry cupboard. <laughs> Many people are poisoning themselves with what they, what they are doing their cleaning with. We had a lady uh, last program. She was 45, and one of the... Guest said to her, are you coming off cigarettes? Because she had a terrible cough. She's never smoked in her life. She's a cleaner. So she's breathing in the chemical fumes the whole time. So part of the program I set up for her when she left us was 
no more chemicals. She said, what if I wear a mask? <laughs> I said, the sound of that chest, uh, I don't like to predict what it'll be like in a few more years if you don't do something. You know, if you don't turn the tap off, you're still going to be mopping up in the other corner. If you don't find the cause, you will never have a cure. There are some things that must stop if you're looking for optimum performance. Be careful on what you're cleaning your teeth with, washing your hair with, washing your clothes with, even the fibres on your clothes. Be, be careful of that because your skin has millions of little holes in it and whatever touches it, it, it absorbs. So be careful of those chemicals. There's a little book I'm sure you're familiar with it called Chemical Maze and that little book will, will, uh, will show you what all those numbers mean on the foods you eat. Electromagnetic field excess. As we were driving, we're staying I think up in the Bombay Hills and as we're driving to this meeting, I saw these big electrical towers and the wires are right on top of houses. Do you know, it never used to be allowed to do that. But we had a lady, she wrote me her, or she sent me her book that she's written. And her book is a story of her journey. She and her husband bought a house. There's the house, sorry, that's the house yard. Here's the house here. And huge, big electrical towers. Sorry, I'm not a great drawer. That, that's an electrical tower. Right out just at the back fence. Now, they put in a swimming pool and chlorine will intensify that electromagnetic field. Plus, at the same time, she's landscaping, beautiful landscaping all around the pool and a lot of them the uh, mulch she used was a bit moulding. Can you see what's happening here? We've got this. In fact, there's about 500 times the electromagnetic field underneath those towers more than is usually coming off the planet because we are electrical people and one of the biggest electromagnetic fields is coming from the sun. But it's not a problem unless we're out there too much. I'm talking about the excess. Now, none of her family got problems, but she did because they're just there at night. And they were a little bit more away. You don't have to go far away and you get an incredible drop. But she's out there, unbeknownst to her, the chlorine in the pool is intensifying. The mouldy uh, mulch, what was happening with this woman is she was getting a chemical, an electromagnetic field, which you can class basically as chemical, and the mould, you can also class them as chemical, building up in her body. At the age of 50, her stomach started to swell, her breast started to release fluid, and if she went anywhere near a mobile phone, she'd begin to dry reach. She had to move out of the house, no doctor would acknowledge her problem. So why can I go near a mobile phone and not start dry reaching, but she would? She was full of poisons. And every time one more drop went in, what's happening to her? She's getting um, spillage. Whereas maybe my poison electromagnetic, maybe I'm there. So if one more drop comes into me, I don't get an overflow. So you see, I don't get a reaction. So what did this woman do? She had to go to a place where there, she had no exposure to an electromagnetic field. She had to go on a very, very uh, strict diet of organic foods. And she had to go through detoxes. So she eventually got her level down so she could basically function in society. None of her family had the problem, remember? They weren't in the backyard all day. They didn't have that close exposure. So if you are in a house under electromagnetic fields, what is my advice? My advice is to move. <laughs> so can you see what's happening in a lot of the time? It's a build-up, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Now it's surprising how much it drops when you just come even a foot or two away. Let's say you've got a, uh, 
uh, uh, electric clock and it's right sitting there and you're sleeping here, you just move it two foot to the other side of the table and you get a three quarter drop in the exposure that you're having. We're in a technological age today. I think it's impossible to totally eliminate, but be very mindful of the danger of overexposure being very close to it. But also the refreshing thought that you don't have to go far away from it and you can get quite a, quite a big drop from it. In many houses, you've got the meter box. So if you've got a meter box there and your bed is there, my suggestion is move the bed <laughs> because we spend a lot of time in that bed, don't we? third of our life we're sleeping. So put the bed on the other side and put a cupboard there. Or if you say to me, but there's nowhere else that the bed can go, you can buy a, a black lead based paint that you can paint over that. It's the lead is not in a form that would harm you, but it, uh, it, blocks that, it blocks the electromagnetic field coming in great amounts. Genetically modified foods. Genetically modified foods are the result of two species DNA being sliced together. For instance, the DNA of an Atlantic salmon and the DNA of a Tomato spliced together in the hope of creating a tomato that will grow in the snow, but it doesn't. And there's this huge grey area that they are, they don't know what they're doing. Genetically modified foods create molecules that the body doesn't know. Genetically modified foods have the ability to tamper with your DNA. Genetically modified foods cause cancer. What's cancer? Cancer is a mutation of the cells. What causes the mutation of the cell? The mutation in the DNA. What causes the mutation in the DNA? <laughs> Genetically modified food can do that and so can these other things. Well, how do you know? Because I know in America, Australia, New Zealand, they do not have to state if the food has been genetically modified. The safest thing to do is to go organic. Now, we are not 100% organic, very difficult to go 100%, but you do the best that you can. We grow quite a bit and we buy as much organic as we can. Mold. Mold is almost nature's genetically, genetic modification. You have a look at in nature, you'll see lichen growing on a tree. It's spliced into the DNA of the tree. It's reproducing us, uh, itself through the tree. David Annabra has a show on ants. And these ants underground, they grow like a fungus, a mold. And the waste that comes off, they roll into little tiny balls and store as their food. But David Annabra noticed that the ant will only tend the mold for half an hour. Then it leaves and then the next shift come on. And he found that when the ant tends the mold for more than half an hour, the mold can actually take over the ant and even reproduce itself through the ant. Sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? What is mold? It's a microorganism. What does microorganism mean? Micro means microscopic. Organism means it's living thing. And microorganisms, there's a few in this classification, but they are everywhere. They're in the air we're breathing, they're on every surface area, they're on our skin, they're in our ears, they're in our nose. In fact, there are 10 times more microorganisms in the body than cells. That's quite phenomenal, isn't it? The largest amount are found in the gastrointestinal tract. And I'm going to give you a break in a minute, and after the break we're going to pursue this a little bit more. But they form a thick turf wall over the villi lining the gastrointestinal tract. So they're everywhere. And they play a very important role in life. Life in a plant, life in a creature, life in humans. But whenever cell damage happens, these microorganisms have the ability to change roles. They now become the cleanup team, or as one microbiologist said to me, he said, Barbara, we call them the garbage collectors. 
collecting the garbage or the cleanup team. And their name is bacteria. That's what bacteria does. It's an opportunist organism. Wherever you'll find filth, you're going to find it. I think we can all testify to that. Florence Nightingale, very famous nurse. She, she made huge changes in uh, the hospital in Scutari. Let me show you. This is the Black Sea. This is Crimea. The British and the French were fighting the Russians. The wounded were put in boats sailed down the Black Sea to Scutari. And Scutari was the port that had a hospital there where the wounded were being taken. Florence Nightingale went to this hospital and found that the death rate was 50%. The conditions in there were appalling. There was raw sewage in the corridors. The doctors didn't wash their hands between operations. And the doctor said to Florence and her nurses, you're not coming in here, this is men's business. But she sent a telegram to her father, who is a wealthy Englishman, and said, Father, I want a shipload of clean mattresses, clean linen, clean bedclothes, clean bandages, and a cook. Because the food, you couldn't even call it food. Well, Two weeks later, another shipload of wounded sailed in and the hospital was already overflowing. So the doctors said to Florence, all right, you can come in. And the first thing Florence did was she started to scrub. She scrubbed and she cleaned and she scrubbed and she cleaned. And finally, the boat came from England with the supplies. Six months, in six months, the death rate went from 50% to 2%. When she finally got back to England, they hailed her as a heroine. I think it was Queen Victoria and Prince Albert had a huge welcoming party. She found out, changed her name to Mary Smith, went down the back gangplank and went home. They said to her later, why did you do that? She said, I am not a heroine. She said, all I did was increase hygiene, sanitation and nutrition. Now, did everyone get that? That's why we can never forget Florence Nightingale. Let me show you something, and this is a graph you will never see in any newspaper or any television. Here were all the diseases, measles, whooping cough, diphtheria, drastic reduction because of what? Increased hygiene, sanitation, and nutrition. And about there, they began to vaccinate. Mm -hmm. Every medical journal, history of it, will show you that graph. In fact, polio was totally wiped out. There's another graph now. It's called autism, epilepsy, cot death. It was Florence Nightingale and her increase in hygiene, sanitation and nutrition that changed the world of nursing. I don't think the pharmaceutical companies will allow a movie to be made of her because <laughs> they would like you to think it was medication, but it was not. When Florence Nightingale read of Louis Pasteur's theory that germs cause disease, she said, this is the theory of a man of a very unstable mind. And anyone who believes it is equally unstable because it defies reason. These microbes are everywhere. As the environment changes, now we get the exterminators. What's their name? Their name is yeast and fungus. That's what they do. That's their role on the planet. As the environment changes, now we get the undertakers. What do undertakers do? They take away dead things. What's their name? That's the mould. And it's not long after the mould stage that the matter is brought back to dust. What does the preacher say at the funeral? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. What's he referring to? He's referring to what's about to take place in that coffin. The matter will be brought back to dust. What I have drawn for you here is the carbon cycle. It's the cycle of life. And a basic 
Law of science states that nothing is created and nothing is destroyed. It just changes form. These are the players in the cycle of life. These are the performers in the cycle of life. And the preacher's referring to Genesis 3.19 where the Bible says, we come from dust, we go back to dust, we're dust. <laughs> and in Psalm 103, the Bible says, where the, where about God, he says, he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. <laughs> Very precious dust. It's the cycle of life. And there are many eminent physicians, professors, scientists who do not agree with Pasteur's theory. It defies reasons. You see, germs don't cause disease. They're the result of unhealthful conditions. What Florence Nightingale did in that hospital was she turned the tap off. There was nothing for these guys to eat. Mm-hmm. What, what research is showing today that the fumes from these things being active are very toxic. There is a series in Australia called Is Your House Killing You? SPS Television had it on. Two DVDs, seven shows, and nearly every show the people are sick because there's mould in their house. This stuff's toxic. In fact, the Bible says if there's mold in the house, the house has to be destroyed. It says picked up, taken out to an unclean place outside the city. In Australia, we call it the tip. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give everyone a break now. It is five to eight. Please come back at five past eight. So that's a 10 minute break. That'll allow you to get a breath of fresh air. There's a water container up the back. And to the left, there's the ladies and the gents. So please have a breath of fresh air and we'll come back at five past eight. Thank you. <laughs> 